Hi folks and welcome to this uh, episode of uh, watercolour uh, demonstrations. I'm Howard Jones and um, I'm just continuing that um, this uh, issue of textures and creating textures. It's a couple of weeks ago, uh, if you've watched the earlier uh, lessons you'll remember that I did um, grass textures in front of a wall and um, I'll try to put a link um, to that if you haven't watched it so you can go perhaps from from here and watch that one at some point so um, I'm just setting my timer here so uh, so that just to indicate that um, gives me a five minute notice as to when this this camera that I use like most cameras only record for 30 minutes so um, it's my little sort of uh, indicator to tell me that I'm running out of time uh, and that I need to reboot the camera anyway um, so I thought I'd use this uh, photo today uh, it's a local lake near to where I live and I thought I'd use um, this backdrop area because it's you know, there's, there's this boat, old boat sort of moored up in the shallows of the lake here on the side. Um, it's a little bit busy around here, not sure how necessary that is, but we'll make a little scene out of this um, and it'll allow me to uh, demonstrate another technique, um, uh, one by where um, I'm using a, a card to scrape into the background. So, a um, couple of things I can use for scraping out. I quite like using the painting knife, the palette knife, um, and a piece of uh, credit card. Any old bit of credit card will do. Um, pencil, of course, and my selection of brushes today are a one inch flat brush, which is all dried hard from yesterday's painting. So just let give that a soak. Uh, a size, what have we got here? I think that's a size 5 round brush and uh, a rigger brush, size 3 rigger brush, an old school brush, really cheap. Um, nice soft natural fibre brush and this is a big mop brush, uh, a squirrel mop brush which I really like. So Let's put those aside for a moment and call on them as and when we need them. A little bit of paint off there. And if you're wondering what that's all about, it's just so that my camera can um, focus. It's got something to focus on. I know that the camera is focusing. So, and of course, for those of you that watch regularly, you'll know that that's my little mini palette for mixing uh, very strong paint. So those, when I need those little dry brush uh, effects. So, the first thing really to mention about uh, techniques, particularly this technique of scraping out, um, it, like a lot of watercolour techniques, requires um, a timing, um, doing things at the right time. So, and that's all about, when I say timing, it's all about the uh, state of the surface of the paper, how wet it is, how dry it is. So I'll um, hopefully be able to demonstrate that now for you. Um, I have this boat, as I say, which is, you know, I'm just using this boat here as um, something to, um, add a bit of interest for this demonstration. There's a little bit of a, uh, detail inside here, a, a sort of decked area, mini decked area at the back there, which is, I think, a seat probably. Um, and then it does something like this through there. And uh, the angle on the front is something like this. Now there are some posts which have a bit of an unfortunate coincidence about them. There's a, I'm not sure whether that's a, a bench or, a, yeah, I think it's a bench, but it sits there right on the same line as the near gunnel edge of that boat. So that's no good. 
Um, that just creates confusion. So if it confuses you in the photo, it's sure to confuse the viewer of the, of the painting. So I'll change that. Um, so we'll perhaps put something a bit taller. We'll put a post in here and we'll move the bench to say here. Something like that. There are grasses. There's a hint of water just about there. Flatness. So this is the grassy area. Little slither of water here. Again. Um, and there's this flooded puddle um, area here. Rather large flooded um, area. So we might use that. As I say, I'd, I, I just want to show you more than anything else um, how I use the the uh, technique of scraping out. So what I'm going to do is for this background, it's far too busy to start painting, you know, um, all those branches. They're rather sort of, there's a lot of sort of in, immature um, bushes, or they may be mature bushes, but there's not much to them. There's no substantial shape in that background. If you squint your eyes, of course, it's just a dark blanket, um, you know, backdrop. So I want to sort of create a few larger tree trunks in here. So let's get started. Make nice Make an, a bit of an emphasis on that surface of that gunnel there. As I say, I'm not worried too much about the other details. I'm just making sure, I want to make sure in this that um, I get across the method of scraping out. So I'm just making these abstract shapes that we can see through the gaps a little more interesting. Yeah, okay. So the first thing I must do is get a lot of paint into the background. But I'll put a wash on, a general wash on first. Uh, I'll pick up a little bit of ultramarine blue here. Just to get something moving. And this is how quick the mop brush uh, applies paint, it's fantastic. And I, if I want texture off this, if, uh, then I hold the brush like so, um, with a thumb on one side, two or three fingers on the other, and that's completely um, free then to make contact across the surface of the paper like that. So, and even when I'm not holding it like that, I tend to hold the brush right at the back here and make contact mostly with the belly of the brush, just the side of the brush. So I'm skimming across where the water is. Now let's get um, something, we'll get a little bit of lemon yellow mixed into this blue for this grassy area here. It's quite a, in the photo, that's quite a cold greeny yellow. Um, so we'll probably have to warm that up a bit just to make it look a little more natural. I sometimes like to, you know, f for another demonstration, like to push my colours. And that is to say that, um, you know, um, colours can be brighter than, uh, than they are in nature. Um, having said that, I've seen these weather conditions many a time when it really is the grass is the, especially in spring, of course, um, where these colours are really quite bright. Um, you almost need your sunglasses on just to look at the colours. So, but um, as I say, I have. Um, just want to sort of calm it down a little bit in this instance. So I'm just picking up this time a little bit of ultramarine blue, uh, sorry, burnt sienna. 
Uh, perhaps a little bit of alizarin crimson. And what this will do, um, picked up a little bit of viridian green there too. What this will do is just make that those greens look a little more natural. And there we go. So say if I do want that puddle later, I think there's um, I don't think there's enough strength of paint on there to have um, spoiled that option. I think we can still do that. So surprising how much these um, paints uh, pale off, of course, when they dry out. Anyway, it's not essential, the, 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 this, this, this bit of water. So let's, this is all still damp. You know, what are we, a couple of minutes in, I suppose, um, of actual painting. So, I'm just going to go really, really strong now. Lots of paint here. Just get everything moving again. It's nearly dry at the edges. Um, paint will dry off at the edges first, near your tape. Uh, because, you know, I don't... Um, I, I rarely stretch my paper these days, if ever. So um, you have to put up with a little bit of the cockling, the buckling of the paper when you're working with this amount of water, water and paint. So um, what you've got to be aware of, I think, really, what I try to be aware of is the fact that the paint, um, uh, will dry out quicker in some areas than others. And as I say, it does tend to sort of do that more at the edges. But where you've got the buckle, you've got a trough in your paper, sort of here and here, it'll, um, it'll take longest to dry out in those areas. So let's keep throwing in the paint here. So my colour mix now is uh, Viridian Green and Burnt Sienna, which gives me a nice sort of olivey colour. And now I'm being a little bit more choosy as to where I apply this paint. I always think of um, this term, you know, that uh, how much is the paint sticking? And the more paint you use, if you can get the paint and water ratio correct, and it's a lot of paint, it's a fair bit of water as well. Um, and if you can get that right, then if I make a mark like this, it'll stay there, even when the paper, paper is wet, quite wet. Um, if the, if Had I put too much water in the mix with the paint on that occasion, then by doing that, that shape would not stay there. And I'll show you exactly what I mean then. I've just picked up water, a lot more water in this brush. Just to show you, here's my water bucket. Pick up a lot of water. You'll see how different this shape that happened that, that occurs now from that that I just did. If I go into here, see how pale that shape is. And if I thirsty this brush, in other words, what I'm doing out of shot here at the moment is I'm taking all the paint out of the water and most of the um, water out of the brush, sorry, and most of the water as well. If I do this, I get an incredibly pale shape there. So it's a very thirsty brush, of course, because what's, what's happening is um, the brush is thirsty. So when it comes into contact with moisture, it says, yes, please, I'll have that. And it just grabs all, all of the, uh, as much water and moisture as it can. Hence, you get this effect of taking paint back off the surface. Um, so play around with this for, for a considerable amount of time, actually. Um, just going back and forth. Um, with those main th three colours really, ultramarine blue, viridian green and burnt sienna, until you get to a point you think, well, yeah, I think that's going to suffice. I think I've got a lot of paint on there. I've got the tonal value and the temperatures where I want them. Um, some cool areas, some slightly warmer areas. But there's a lot of paint, a lot of paint used. And I'm keeping this, if you notice, I'm keeping this vertical movement with the brush all the time 
I'm now trying to keep aware, make sure that I'm aware of um, the uh, uh, timing issue of getting things scraped, of when, to, when you can go in and scrape the paint back off. So I feel as though this, there's a, quite a shine on most of this area. So that tells me really that it's too wet. It's still too wet for me to scrape into that particular area. Um, just to give you some idea of the timing issue, um, or when the state of the paper is ready for scraping, it should be as the sheen just goes off the paper. So it's somewhere between sort of um, damp and and um, and dry. Um, you do get used to it after a while. You, you can just sort of see it. You get a sense of when it's when it's right to to scrape. So. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, different areas, um, it, do, it doesn't dry out in a uniform fashion, particularly because of the buckling of the paper. So the areas that, if you can see, this is a sort of raised area, okay, it's, it's the papers popping up like this. So it's going to dry out there first before it, drives in this, before it dries out in this neighbouring area, which is a trough here okay there's a trough here just here it'll take longer to dry out there so I'm going to chance my luck here and scrape into this slightly drier area and we'll put in here what I'm hoping is going to look like tree trunk catching the light here so yeah it's borderline um, as you can see um, that's quite a Clear, I've made quite a clear mark there. Now here's an additional bit of advice. Um, we should always, when we're dealing with creating light, because that's what we're doing, the only reason why we can see a tree trunk is because there's light hitting it. Now, I tend to, if I, if I want the light hitting the left-hand side of the tree, I will scrape from left to right, from left to right. What that does is, it leaves just down here a dark edge, which will give you the effect of light hitting one side and the shadow on the other. Um, if I were to do it opposite, of course, work from right to left, I'd be saying that the light is coming from the right and hitting the right-hand side of the object. So... Um, I do sometimes forget, and I will accidentally um, go the other way sometimes. Um, but it, 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 as long as 90% of what you're doing is um, giving this the, 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 the same, you know, what you want to avoid is mixed messages. Um, as long as the majority of what you're doing is the same sort of, uh, the same direction. So in here, let's cross a couple of these things over a little bit. And it's, yeah, I'm struggling to get it to stick in the wetter areas. But there does seem to be a slightly drier area here. You've got to be a little bit careful. I'm using, um, this is why um, I'm using this particular paper. There, there are several, quite a few brands of papers that will allow you to scrape. Um, but the reason why I sometimes favour Bockingford, which is not the most expensive paper, is because it's very um, forgiving. It, it, it takes a lot of punishment. So sometimes I will favour it when I'm intending to do these sort of paintings. Now then. Okay. Um, when it's... There's, a, there's another technique you can do and that's just to scrape like this which is great for I find for suggesting a, a fence line but um, it's funny it's got to be at a slight I got I feel as though it's got to be at a slightly um, you, you've got to do that um, a, a little more carefully because that's when you can sometimes damage the paper so be a little bit more gentle when you're, um, so I'm, you're just using a downward um, action here, okay. Imagine an old f post fence, rather, fence line over there, just telling us where the old fence line is. It's 
great fun, you know. Um, you got to try to be have some <laughs> discipline over it because you'll end up just scraping everything everywhere in every area, and that's that's something you've got to try to avoid. Um, you know, in some of my other videos, I've mentioned that the ratio of how much of each thing that we do because. I, I was terrible when I started out. I used to sort of spoil a lot of my paintings because I discovered this fantastic technique, and uh, like a child in a sweet shop, sort of, I'd be um, I'd be using this this newfound technique everywhere, every square inch of my painting. Needless to say, things started looking a little bit, a um, little bit awful. Uh, um, you know, they were they weren't. They weren't my best paintings, but of course it was, I, I was learning um, t the skills of, of watercolour. So you, you put up, you do, you have to put up with a lot of bad paintings. It's only the bad paintings that sort of uh, move you on. So... Let's just put a, a little bit more in. I'm just grabbing the moment while I can because I'd say within, this is a fairly warm room, I'd say within the next five minutes, maybe less, this will have gone past the point of opportunity to scrape. It, it'll be too dry. So, so at the sake of risking um, that very uh, thing I warned you about, don't do too much. I thought, I think it's only sort of fair that I show you as much of this as possible. But do bear in mind I might be overdoing it for the sake of this uh, purpose of this demonstration. So, but it's a great effect. It really is um, a fantastic effect. So I'll leave, I don't know whether you noticed, I've left a little rest area. Um, again, because you can have too much of a good thing. If it's if you completely obliterate, if you if you just use this technique too much, it won't work. It'll look awful. Now, a couple of weeks ago, um, if you remember, um, I did a, a, a sort of uh, scraping out to infer grasses, um, sort of farmland, sort of rough wild grasses in front of a wall, um, and I used a similar technique then, um, but. If you imagine, if I were to continue this scraping into the foreground, because I could have, I could have kept this all nice and swimming with juicy paint and have put some grasses in here in much the same way as we've put the trees in. Um, but then there would be uh, too much. You could certainly do a little bit down here. So if you if you wanted to sort of, sort of suggest that the grass has got a little more heavy, let me, I'm just picking up some um, ultramarine... Sorry, I always call this colour, I call everything ultramarine blue and I can't think of the name of the colour. I'm just picking up some burnt sienna um, with a bit of ultramarine in it. And we'll say that uh, perhaps this area here has got some slightly darker grasses. Um, and maybe we'll suggest that that reflected dark water is there. What I want to show you is a little bit of that scraping in the foreground can work as long as you're uh, quite disciplined with it, that you don't do too much of it. It's a, you know, as, as a tutor, it's difficult sometimes to, to, to say what you, sh exactly how much of these things you should do and shouldn't do. I think you've got to do everything to a point by where you know you've learnt it. Um, you know, you have to do things over. It's, re it's all about repetition. Um, but once you've... My, my, my additional tip there is once you feel as though you've grasped it and you've got it in, in your kit bag, you've learnt it, um, then you need to sort of um, remind yourself just how much 
uh, you use of everything that you've learned. All those things that you've learned are basically individual little, um, it's, it's an arsenal of techniques and you must use them accordingly. It's a bit like a cooking recipe, you know, too much of one ingredient will, will spoil um, the whole pot sort of thing. So um, just, just be a bit careful. So likewise, I'm just waiting a little bit before I can scrape a few grasses in here. I've placed in those couple of verticals that will suggest uh, a blocked area of shape of grass, but I'll scrape through those in a moment. Okay, um, now then, on top of the scraping, I can um, put a, use a more traditional technique, of course, and I've picked up the rigger brush. I'll use um, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna here like this, nice sort of strong mix. And as I say, we can overpaint this stuff at the back with something a little more traditional in terms of technique like this. And the combination of the two, of the scrape out and this, you might want to call it a direct approach, this, di di you know, by painting the shapes with the brush, you're using a, a, a probably, it should be described as a, a more direct uh, technique. Like this. So just running some of this stuff. I had a post here originally. Even posts, you know, I like to scrape into. But again, remember it's a timing issue, so don't just put the paint on then go straight into it with the scrape, scraping out. It, um, it won't work. You'll just damage the paper and leave marks there. Just tapping a little bit of uh, additional uh, shape into there. Do less of this down here because I just feel as though you know, I'm not sure the photo de um, depicts this, but I want to sort of suggest that this is a slightly closer area. And as we move to the left, it just goes away from us a little bit. So we'll make things a lot more, um, put, put a lot more water in the mix when we do similar things to what we were doing over here, but with a lot more water in them. And I'm sort of, um, this is something I'm doing right now that you can do quite a lot of before it starts getting to look overdone, you know, overcooked or whatever. Um, just pick up that, I put that brush in with the rigger, um, sorry, I put that post in with the rigger brush. There's another post here, but I'll use a, just an ordinary size five round colors, mostly ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. Sometimes a bit of uh, raw sienna for these posts. There's one in front of the boat, a couple of posts here. I think we had a bench we decided just about here. Under the bench, there'll be a, a shadow that we'll put in in a moment. So that was the first post I did about five minutes ago. If we want to scrape into that somewhere, just partially scrape into it. Don't scrape the whole length of the post, just partially scrape into it. And, uh, and sometimes just put, press this metal f um, knife down on the surface. That's also a good idea. I think we can scrape through here now. So, you know, it's timing thing again. Couldn't do it a moment ago, but I think I can do it now. And this is a really cheeky little um, technique. I'm, if I, press the blade of this knife down into the wet paint or the still damp paint, I can m sort of um, clone 
if you like, uh, similar shapes. I can just drag, drag the paint. So just drop the blade in there, and there'll be paint on the edge of that knife. But that mm, that's borderline getting uh, a little too busy now. So just be a bit careful there. Okay. Um, Now, I'm going to skim across here to suggest the water is, is, uh, is that broken effect of water. Using the same colors as I used for here, which was ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, little bit of viridian green. And with this brush, and if I splay it out like that, the delivery that comes off it will be broken. There we are, you can see it there, just there. And it's that effect that you get just as the water is shallowing out and going into the grasses. So, there we are. Right, and now we should deal with the boat. So I'm going to speed dry this so we can move on. Just scrape a little bit out of that post there. Let's just, just speed dry this very quickly. So, um, as you probably already guessed, now that I've dried everything, that's the end of the scraping. There's no, there's no way that you'll succeed by scraping into that paper now that it's dry. So, um, if you wanted to put additional scraping in, you'd have to reload the surface area again and, and, and do the whole process again, waiting for it to sort of go to that damp territory before you can scrape into it. And that can be done. You know, you can do this multiple times, but the, the, there comes a point where you've got to stop scraping and just get it dr completely dry. Because if you do end up working in that territory where it's just not... <laughs> it's not damp enough to make a mark. There's a danger of damaging the paper. Okay, um, I'm going to go into my little boat. I'm going to paint the little boat now. I'm just picking up a, a turquoise blue here. And I'll just deliver some paint roughly where I want it. Down here, something like this. Flood it with a lot of water. Cross the back end of the boat, which is about there somewhere for now. That will have to go a bit darker. Slightly different colour inside the boat. So I'll move from the turquoise to uh, ultramarine blue. There's a little board there, bench sort of seat, which I'll leave white. And make that slightly darker because the actual um, flatness of the inside deck of the boat is a lot lighter because it's facing the light. So we'll leave that nice and light. Like that, and uh, I think we'll just darken up one or two areas of that the boat hull, about here somewhere. A little bit of raw sienna with with the turquoise will help do that. And I'm just going to mix up a small amount of strong paint now. So I take my pickle jar lid. I'll take fresh ultramarine blue, like this. It's got to be fresh paint. 
and then fresh burnt sienna and make a really dark mix here and that's going to do for my edge of my little boat here just underneath here I think I'll put a little bit of red in this just to indicate just to sort of separate if you like the other areas um, you could even use a bit of cadmium red to do this but just to sort of say this is part of that little rowing boat and, and not a dark mark like all the other dark marks around here something like that to the front end of the boat there's that little seat something just to indicate the front end of that the pointed end of that little boat there that should be enough there we had a little bench so we put a little bit of dark and on the bottom edge of that to indicate a, uh, a shadowed underside. And now, just getting rid of, um, just getting, getting rid of a couple of little white areas of paper that I don't think are working. Okay, let's put a little bit of shadow underneath the bench, which is ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson. And here, something like that. A little shadow off these posts, maybe. Broken, very broken shadow because it's falling on a broken surface, which is grass. Perhaps there's something coming across from here. A couple of additional long shadows. And that must be a shadowed area back there, mustn't it? Just under here like that. A little bit warmer. I think that shadow just needs to be a little bit warmer. There is some kit or paraphernalia inside this little boat, but uh, I'm not sure I need to put that in. Um, I do feel though as though that does need to be warmed up again, even further than I, than I warmed it up earlier. So I'm just picking up a little bit of vermilion which is a, a very similar color to scarlet I'll just put in a broken broken line of uh, that red that really makes the uh, little boat stand out a bit better okay um, I'm gonna go back to the rigger brush because I do like I, I use a lot of line in my in my artwork in my paintings, um, so I use the rigger brush a lot. I'm a big fan of of the line, so um, we had posts that we scraped out. We can put a couple of um, painted posts in posts that I'm using the, the direct method for direct approach and we'll even run some wires for some of those now there's an area here um, it was almost as though the this little background area wasn't speaking to the foreground so what I'm doing here is I'm just making sure that 
verticals across this divide just here just just at that, that point there things must cross this line otherwise there's a there's an issue it, it doesn't there's something odd will 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 it'll cause one of those odd sort of situations you think not sure what it is there's something wrong here and i can't sort of work out what it is but it's often that we often don't um i think we often section out our areas in our paintings and um and overlook important things like linking and co the, the cohesion. So, perhaps a little mooring rope off the boat itself. One at the front, one at the end. And um, this is just total ad lib and I, I think every painting requires at least a bit of ad lib a little bit of um, that that stuff that you you put in because it, it's not it, it's something you feel as though is there this is just a feeling uh, something to improve the feel of the painting I think we're nearly there so a couple of these grasses, again, this is similar to what I was talking about here at this line. Think of horizontal lines. Um, some of these grasses really should pop up and, um, uh, you know, we should indicate that they're in front of the boat. They're near to us, so they're going to be that bit taller. And they're going to appear to be uh, running through the boat like this. A little bit of gouache is usually where I finish. So it's just gouache straight from the tube that I like to tap. And again, this is one of those. The reason why I do this is because nature, uh, when we're out there in amongst the um, the real thing, there are all sorts floating around in the air. We might not. They might not be immediately evident, but painting is about creating, as I say, often what we feel rather than what we see. A little bit of white gouache line in places. Now I'm just going to take a um, large flat brush and give the whole painting a bit of depth because um, at the moment we've got, we've sort of inferred um, different, dif different uh, proximity, if you like, different distances. But now I think we've got to do that shadow, the, the ambient light, the, the shadow, the overall sort of shadow area that gives everything its Re that really gives everything its sort of three-dimensional look about it. I'm just cleaning my palette there. Flat brush. I'm going to speed dry this actually first before I do this. I think it's always a good idea to um, before you put, if you're going to apply the shadows as I do, and that is usually right at the end, um, it's really important that you're applying that shadow to dry paper. Okay, so with the paper now dry, I'm going to pick up ultramarine blue, a lizarin crimson, make a big, I like to make a a very large puddle of this shadow mix. I'd rather have uh, some left over. If you're really conscious of, you know, paint wasting, then make, uh, a, a, when you need to make a lot of it, then you can always pour this into, if you're careful off the palette, you can always pour this into um, a small container and keep it. Because it does keep, use it as a mix for, your next shadow. It's not something I do, but 
you know, it's something I've thought of doing many a time is just pre-mixing um, your shadow so you've got something to start with. You probably have to adjust it when you come to do your next painting, but um, at least you've got something to sort of get you off the uh, off the mark sort of thing. Okay, and this is what I do when I paint my shadows. I have to hand a handful of paper, which I form into a ball like that. A nice sort of flattish surface so if I apply a shadow somewhere and I don't like it then I can take it off but I start with the I start you know with the um, the practical idea first of all and that is where you know first establish the places where you'd expect to see shadow behind the boat definitely um, on the side of the post there something like this across the ground um, some areas across here as the grasses throw things, throw their little shadows across. Shadows are great for connecting too. If you almost run a horizontal line from one side of your painting to the other, um, that, that's, that's great again for just keeping things moving. Um, but the, when we get into the background, these, are, these shadow shapes are not, so, not quite so sort of isolated. Um, they're more blanket-like. So before I do that, I should, of course, suggest that there be shadow up this end of the little boat here. And once, once delivered, then I just take a slightly thirsty brush and thin that out that way, like that. I will put sometimes a little bit of warmth in my shadow areas, these recesses. Okay. Now then, on to what's going on in the background. So it does seem to be a slightly darker area back there above ground level. So I'll just almost make a sort of wall, if you like, of shadow above one level of ground. As we get out to here, things get a lot more watery and weaker. The shadow becomes less intense, mostly. It's a little bit darker up there in the corner. If I want to use that, I can. Just glancing up at my photo. If I like what the photo's doing, I include it. If I don't like what the photo show me, I, I leave it out. Uh, I don't know, I don't just leave it out. Uh, I, I will sort of invent something that I think would work better for the painting. Okay. And then if there's any hard edges, if the if the shapes start getting too geometrical, which they do, and I, I, I and I don't mind that at all. They are mostly geometrical when they're the shadows are seen through other objects um, like this. Um, but I, 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 I will, as I'm doing now, just soften some of those edges in places. Bring in a little bit of warmth into one, of those, one or two areas of those shadows. Just picking up a, a bit of light red this time. Just dropping that in in the lower areas around here. And then we'll reflect some of that darker shadow in this uh, ground water, low-lying water. Something like that. And I think we should put the mount around this at this stage. And, you know, just to see if have a look at the balance of things. Probably need a bit of balance, counterbalance down here. It's almost as though this is a dark area and this is a light area. So we've got to bring something in to uh, bring a bit of cohesion again. So I'm mixing up what's more or less the, the, the shadow mix again here. Ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson with a bit of burnt sienna. 
And as, it, as it's falling over grass, I will make that same sort of broken delivery here at like this. There we are. Let's leave it like that. And put the mount around it and have a look. And there we are. Um, hope you found that uh, little lesson um, useful. Remember the main point of this, um, this demonstration was to show you how to achieve the scraping out technique, that, that texture um, that we can create by scraping into damp paint. So it's a timing issue, it's the consistency of paint. Um, if you get those two things right, it'll always work for you. Um, anyway, good luck and see you at the next one. So I had this afterthought here, um, and I looked at it, uh, and you can just pop the video back uh, a couple of minutes. You'll see that um, the boat didn't really stand out enough for my liking. Um, so um, I decided to pick up the brush again and just take the shadow background right up to the edge mostly of the little boat, particularly around the front end here. Still a bit of a broken fashion to the delivery, leaving some shapes, but um, I felt as though it made for a much better painting by popping the boat out, um, uh, showing the boat off a little bit better.